Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of the show and a very special edition of the show. Look who we've got joining us here today. None other than the legendary Dennis DeYoung, solo artist, founder, vocalist, keyboard player from Styx. Welcome, Dennis. So happy to have you on to talk about the new album and anything else you want to talk about here today. Dennis DeYoung, come on down. You're the next contestant on The Price is Right. And I'm Pete Pardo. Is that another right. Pardo? Was that, was that you or is that Don Pardo? Well, you know, it's funny because I have been asked that question throughout my life. Are you are you related to Don Pardo? You, how about that Saturday Night Live guy, that uh, NBC studio Don Pardo guy? I got so sick of hearing it when I was younger. I used to tell people he was my uncle. But that only gets you so far because I don't have any other stories besides that, unfortunately. So, but no, I'm not related. I'm not related at all. Is Pardo short for something? No, no, it's just Pardo. Yeah. Is it Italian name? Is that an Italian name? Well, it, it is also, in this instance, it's Spanish. My father's side of the family is from Galicia, Spain. So that's where it originated. But it's also known to me an Italian name as well. And my mother's Italian. So I got the little Mediterranean blood going on here. Your mother's, what kind of Italian is she? From Sicily. Well, she's not, but that's where. You know is your mom still alive? Yep, yep. You know how to make a Sicilian omelet? Do I know how? I do not actually know. Yeah, steal the eggs. <laughs> Cut it out. You got to add a little gravy to it then, I would assume, probably at the end, right? No, no gravy? No. no gravy. That's what I got to do. <laughs> so, where are you located? I am in uh, the Hudson Valley, New York, up near West Point. Okay. New York. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So about 70 miles north of New York City. I'm sure, you're, I'm sure you've been this neck of the woods before. I know you, you have played in Poughkeepsie at, at, at a time or two in your career, I'm sure. That's literally minutes yeah. from here. So, uh, so, so happy to have you. So uh, before we get started, the White Sox or the Cubs? I was going to do this whole interview with my White Sox hat on. I was, and I thought, well, you know, Tony La Russa, their manager, I'm a huge uh, baseball fan. Uh, I've been uh, very, he's one of my best friends in the world. He's just come back to manage the White Sox this year. Yep. And when he was, um, he first came here, there was a, <clears throat> shall we say, an economic squeeze on the White Sox because the Cubs and the White Sox, there's two teams in the, in the same city. So the White Sox are always like the underdogs because the South Side, which is where Sticks was formed. But Tony, they, they hired Tony, Bill Veck, out of the minors, uh, to manage the White Sox because he could work cheap. That was the only reason. So he came up here. So one day, he's like 39. Okay, but I don't know this. I'm driving in my car and I hear on the radio that uh, Tony La Russa requests a stick song, the new manager of the White Sox to be played on, I guess it was The Loop. I can't remember the radio station. And I thought, a baseball manager wants this is a Sticks fan? This is, you know, baseball manager with Casey Stengel or Al Lopez, guys who could, wouldn't know sticks if they fell on them. So as a lark, I've never done anything like this in my life, but as being such a wild White Sox fan, I went, I, gra I grabbed a Paradise Theater tour jacket and I drove down to the ballpark and I, I went in right in the front door and I said, I'd like to leave this for Tony La Russa. And they said, okay. And, uh, and then she, the woman says, wait a minute. She called the clubhouse. It's middle of the afternoon. He says, uh, would, you, would you like to go see Tony? Oh, oh, oh man, I'm going to go in the clubhouse. Can, are you a baseball fan at all? Yes, I am. Oh, can you imagine? I no, I'm, not, I'm, a, I'm a Mets fan. I'm not a Yankees fan. So, uh, yeah. Uh, that, that doesn't Mets. matter. You're, you're a fan. I love baseball. So, I, love, I always have. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm nine years old again, going to my first baseball game with my father. So I walk. I'm all by myself. I walk in, I open the clubhouse door and there's all the ball players, and uh, Tony Larusa, he's standing there with, uh, you know, it, it, it was it's spring, so he had like, they, had, they were long underwear under their uniforms because it's cold. And he's standing there with his long underwear flip flops. He goes, Dennis DeYoung. I go, Tony Larusa. So this, wait, wait, wait. We go in the clubhouse and, and it was office. And I'm thinking to myself, is this, is this real? So I'm sitting, there's a guy from Sports Illustrated. He's in the office. He's doing a story about the new White Sox. They just got Carlton Fisk, <clears throat> Greg Luzinski, and Ronald Floor. So I'm in there, 
and we're talking we can't believe he loves sticks i love baseball and the guy's writing right so we're talking so i'm not thinking anything of this i just can't believe this is happening anyway the issue comes out for sports illustrated i mentioned in sports illustrated i'm in and, and i never had to get jock itch this is <laughs> gotta love you know, it right never, that's a great story. i never got toe fungus jock itch nothing so um yeah it was amazing anyway yeah i'm a white Sox fan and he's come back here now to try to uh take the white Sox to the pennant so i watch every night and uh it's great because when you're you know when you're under house arrest like i am apparently um uh, <clears throat> you know i'm watching baseball every night did you i didn't know those those ankle ankle bracelets they chafe did you notice they really get a you get a rash assume, i would assume they would Especially after all the days you had to wear them. So, you know. Are you locked in your house? Uh, I mean, we have been, but here in New York, we're starting to get out a little bit now. I, I actually just went out and had a slice of pizza without a mask. Woohoo! Are, are you, you've been vaccinated, then you're good, yes. right? Yep. Yep. Are you, are you married? Yep. No kids. Got kids? Uh, stepkids. Oh, stepkids. Okay. Cool. How long have you been married? Uh, 12 years. Well, congratulations thank you okay anyway back to what we're doing here back to what we're doing here but now, you're gonna ask me about this stuff behind me aren't you yeah i mean that's uh, look at all those golden platinum records there i mean that's uh, i'm going to do a camera pan of zoom um oh my delete is it keep going anyway um yeah, are those movie don't... posters there too are those movie posters Dennis? yeah yeah those are all those are all uh, movies my songs have been in they're oh. not it goes the hallway was way right down there's more down there anyway uh, don't get too excited because, like I said, that stings powder room. It's just a green screen. <laughs> it's still pretty amazing to see all that. So, um, yeah, now here's what this is my studio down here. This is where I do everything you have recorded from um, 100 years from now. Um, even that sticks. Um, my work on Brave New World was was done here on the board not in this building so um yeah i've had that board a long time and i, I do all the recording down here and uh you know it's it's a it's a digitally controlled analog board so it really sounds nice but you know in this last record the last two i did volume one or two it was coughing uh pete and sputtering and you know it was it sounded a little like doc holiday at times you know so it was like i was calling people in it was a huge pain in the ass but i i, I like the way this stuff sounds and uh, I record on radar. You know what radar is? No. It's a great, I don't like Pro Tools. I know it's easy and fast, and, but this is the way I do things. I'm, I'm too old to change now, if you know what I mean. At this point, you know. Did you think what am I back in, what was it, 2007, when you released 100 Years From Now, that you'd be doing two albums in 2020, 2021? I mean, uh, I mean, that was a long time ago. It's been a while since we've seen anything from you. Well, um, no. Uh, I, you may have heard the story, but I'll make it brief because, I, you know, I've done so many of these Zooms and told this story. Kids, I'm sorry. I've only got so many stories. I mean, I make up lies from time to time to entertain you, but really, this is the story. Peter Rick, well, here's the story. 2014, I do that live from LA, DVD, and double the knowledge stuff for Frontiers Records. Serafino Perry, you know, he bought, we owned it. You know, we owned the rights to that stuff. So he bought it and he made a beautiful package um, as the Italians will do. You know, they do, a, we do it up big here, Dennis. Do good so, work, we do good work. Yeah. My mother's Italian, by the way, where she was. Anyway, um, so I'm half Italian. Unfortunately, it's the upper half, Never mind. So um, right after that, a, couple, a year and a half after that comes out, he's, uh, Serafino says, Dennis, we want you to make a, a new studio album. And I think, why? That's what I said to him. Why would I do that? It's 2016. And I think, well, I know who my fan base is. You know, there's a small part of the fan base who will say, we want new music from you, Dennis. And then in order to get hired, you better be playing Come Sail Away and Babe. That's what Mr. Robot, you got to do that. This is how it works. All the fans out there, look it. You can be the biggest fan in the world, but don't be... Do us a favor, us old guys. Don't be, don't be the biggest fool. You know, you can't make a living playing new music. Nobody can. 
No, did I say nobody? Nobody my age can. Right. Taylor Swift, maybe. Um, so I, I didn't want to make an album. Uh, screw it. And then uh, a year and a half later, uh, Peterick, Jim Peterick from Survivor fame, Ides of March, he lives three blocks from here where I live. And uh, I'm in a gated community, mainly to keep him out. But anyway, he, he, he figured out a way uh, to, yeah, Dan, I, I told the story. If this is true though, Dan, he called me and he called me. Dan, you know, uh, the world needs your music. I said, have him text me, don't believe it. Nobody gives a shit, you know, and so, him and Serafino did a tag team on me. And I said, all right, Jim, uh, you need songs. Pete, listen to what I'm about to say. This is the serious part of the interview. Okay, you're still wearing your hair like it's 75 for crazy. So listen to me. It's songs, it's me. This is how I learned from the Beatles and I try to translate it, translate it into sticks. Not to be the Beatles, but say, you know, style changes, Pete. Today you got long hair and satin pants. Today, today you got your head shaved and you got a bone in your nose. Uh, the, the other guys are clean, kind of beautiful thing, what a thing. And then now you got tattoos everywhere. That's that's artifice. That's the grand illusion. That's that's just that that's not real. That's ephemeral. Great songs, Pete. That's all it is. It's songs. So I told Peter Rick. And Serafino, there's no point to me making an album if I can't write a song that's worthy of consumption by whoever these people are that are, you know, they're gonna at, at some point steal it. So um, send me some, what are you working on? So he sent me this song, Land of the Living. It's on volume two. It's a demo sketch of what he does. Help me finish the song. I listened and went, you know what? That's, that's, that's catchy tune. I said, okay. So we sat down and then we wrote eight songs together. Now we had tried this like 15 years earlier. Ten, I, who, I'm 74. I don't know. Every time I wake up, it's Thursday. So I look back and I thought, um, we sat in a room, he and I, like Lennon and McCartney looking at each other, going to create a song from note one. <laughs> Didn't work. <laughs> so I thought, hey, I don't need this. You know, uh, even Tommy and JY, we said we collaborated. We had, what do you think it is? What do you think? Can you put this into a, you know, into a blender and will it be a song? So this time was different. And we wrote all these songs. I thought, well, okay. And we start demoing them. He has a studio. And because um, my studio was down. It's, it was down, wasn't working. I wasn't going to spend money. I'm a cheap son of a bitch. So I'm not going to spend money if, if I'm not going to do it. And so the, the contract is the, Dennis, I give you money to make a direct. And um, I don't want to take his money, Pete, until I know I got the songs. Right. Because the minute I take money, you know what the next question is? Where's the record? Right, when's, when, when's everything gonna be ready to go? Yeah, exactly. That, then the you know, clock starts right? ticking, right? Yeah. No, Peter Rick tours. I'm doing 70 shows a year. I'm old. I, I have, you know, I mean, this is, this is a lot of stuff. Uh, like when you're gonna sing during the week and you're gonna play in the weekends, you gotta remember on the weekends, people pay dough to hear you sing. This is finite. You gotta, you gotta treat it with respect. So it went on and on and on. And we, oh, this is good. And so finally, to make this the longest answer to any question ever asked, um, we got these songs. I said, I'll take the deal. One album. I don't want, that's it. Don't bother me no more. I'm going to make this record and wave goodbye to the fans, which is a, give, it a, give me a chance to do that. Um, rather than sit on my lazy ass, which was what I was doing, because I don't really want it. You know, look at Pete, this is a judgment game. Numbers and judgment, that's all it is. It's not art, bullshit. It's numbers, it's a numbers game. People say, oh, you make this, you make this record and I loved it and nobody bought it. You know what I say? Bafangul. <laughs> Are you kidding me? The only reason I get to make records is because somebody bought them. Because then the record company gives me more money to, to make more. Right. If this is art, it's commercial art. And so the thing that gripes me about 
the bullshit in our business is the illusion that we all create. They get people to buy stuff. I talked about it on the Grand Illusion in 77. I said, don't be fooled by the radio. This is an illusion. Get it, we're all the same. Mm -hmm. Look it up, don't look up to me. I've been saying it all my life. Don't put me on a pedestal and look up my skirt. That's a bad thing. Don't do that with me, okay? I'm a guy who played accordion and was Beatle dreaming. That's all. And if you think I'm more than that, shame on you, okay? So now I'm at a point in this conversation where I can't even fucking remember what the question was. <laughs> you see what happens when you let old people out in the middle of the week? We got the olds, Dennis. We got the olds. What can I tell you? <laughs> so anyway, um, we so, put so you got enough for two albums, right? I, yeah, well, I had eighteen songs. I, I spent the money. I overspent because everybody, all, all this old farts, we're going to spend more than we should. Uh, you people want new, new music. Uh, here's the reality. Nobody wants to pay for it because the people who would pay for it traditionally can't figure out, out a way to recoup it. In, in the old days, and they still do this, in the old days, they should figure out a ways to, you know, to recoup the money by stealing from the artist, which, yeah. still, which they still do. Yep. So now the profit margins are zero or nothing. So here's the 18 songs and then the, uh, the president said i want all the songs and i said no you can't put them all on a cd i'll give you two and then he said the magic words pd said we'll make them into two volumes and i'll double the guarantee now i'm not a math i'm not a math major but this part i understood <laughs> I said, there's more lira involved? Yes, and, because, and really I had spent so much already, right? You're like an idiot. And I'm doing, listen, I'm doing it by myself. I mixed everything by myself in this room um, because you, got, you can't just do it the way you used to do. So anyway, I'm, I'm, here's, here's the, the upside is they made two volumes and they said, we'll call it uh, volume one, volume two, because they couldn't think of anything more pretentious than that. So that, that's how it happened. Um, and then I added four new songs during the pandemic um, to, to make the seven that I had left over into 11. Because when I sat down to make num the first one, I said, the minute I realized there were gonna be two, I said, you can't front load it and have the second one be so, you know, just be, you know, the, the weak sisters. So that's, that's the story how volume one and volume two came, came to be. I'd argue that the second one, which is this one right here, which just came out, is stronger than the first one. So I think... You, yeah, yeah. You know what I say? I say what Annie Lennox would say to you if she was on the show. Who am I to disagree? <laughs> I traveled the world and the... Sun. Yeah. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Yeah, no, it is. And um, probably Isle of Misanthrope, knowing you by, you know, th this this... This site is for proggies and heavy metal hard rockers because apparently nobody else but those people exist anymore to talk about rock and roll. I know. You know <laughs> I, I, the, the prog noggins and the guys are going like this. Can the singer sound worse? <laughs> okay. So these are, this is genre driven, niche stuff. Pete, listen to me. You, music is big, it's beautiful. It, absolutely. It's this big. It's not this big. It's this big. Luciano Pavrotti making you cry when he sings Ness and Dorma. Bon Scott over here. Right? Yeah. Guys got rhythm. <laughs> Everything in between. Music is bigger than all of us, Dennis. Bigger it, than this all. This is what I say to you. Playing the accordion taught me all this. Plus, don't get boobs. So, this, as I look at this, it's too big for me not to enjoy it all. And I learned from the Beatles who said this. Doesn't matter as long as it's good. Yeah. That's what they said. And I went, <clears throat> you're right. And that's what I thought. So when what's left are you guys. I call you the prognogging dead enders. God bless you. That's what you are. I, I respect you. I appreciate it. I know why you like what you like about that you think I don't. I was there when it was being created. That's right. You like Man of Miracles? You, and you've seen my ranking the albums of Sticks, so you know exactly which ones I like the most, right? So Yeah, and, and as much as I love you, 
I think you're nuts. Anyway, that's another, that's another subject. We can get into that later if you want to go album by album, and I'll explain to you why your, your opinions, though valid, they're nutty. Anyway, um, so did you have, where did you have Man of Miracles? Uh, Man of Miracles, I believe, geez, five or six. Jesus if, I, if I remember uh, correctly. I mean, all right, I, I went had, back. I mean, I, I can remember the top ones, right? So I had Grand Illusion, number one. I had Pieces of Eight, number two. I'm pretty sure I had, uh, it was either Equinox or Crystal Ball was number three. And then it might have been Cornerstone. Now, I think you went off the deep end after that. I haven't memorized. I watched it when it came, when the guy sent it to me. It was a month, how long ago? It was a while. That was a while and, ago, yeah, last year sometime. Uh, you know, I thought you were going backwards and going, hmm, what's wrong with this guy? So as we got closer to the top, I thought, well, he's got that part right. So you went like this. The ones that, that were absolutely, you know, unequivocally, no argument, the best. And then you fell into, you, you fell into the river sticks where there was a wooden nickel boat going by. I love That's the old stuff. The old stuff is great. <laughs> I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to question that. But I went back and listened because you, as you know, I have, I haven't been kind to most of those wooden nickel records because I know how and why they were recorded. And that sticks with you. <laughs> sticks. Um, so, uh, yeah. Man of Miracles. <clears throat> Schizophrenic. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, one of one of my co later questions for you. We might as well talk about it now. Those early albums, you, it's almost like you never knew what you were going to get. You get a little hard rock, you get a little bluesy boogie, you get a little pop, you get a little prog rock, you get a little psych. But that's what made those albums so great, Dennis, because you guys were like coming from all different directions and kept people like me on our toes all the time, right? I mean, that's to me the appeal of all those early albums. That you mentioned bluesy boogie. I dated her in high school. Nonetheless. Um, here's what it is. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you this story because I'm about ready to stop doing all this shit. You know, I've been telling my story because so much bullshit, Peter, has been said about this band. Some by the band members on a campaign to somehow discredit me. I love those guys. I don't know what they're trying to do that to me. Eh, I'll tell you about that later, but that don't make any sense. And my father used to say to me, don't shit where you eat. This is a good thing, you right? You don't do that. Right. Every time anybody insults a Sticks fan, including me, because I've said, I don't, I don't like three of those wooden nickel records. I'll tell you why in a minute. The minute you do that, guys like Peter going, hey, blow me. I love that, right? That's what, so you can't go around and tell him. Well, well, at least with wooden nickel, it's such a small group of people, Peter. You're only this big because they didn't sell anything. If yep. you say that about it with something that sold millions, you're insulting millions of people. <laughs> anyway, so getting back to Wooden Nickel. Well, we are a very successful cover band. We could just do the shit out of us. You heard me, uh, you want, to, want me to do the uh, Bon Scott? I can do, you want me to do Robert Flagg? I can do, I can do that stuff. I'll hurt myself. Well, we don't want you to do that. <laughs> no, not this age. So, although if you hurt yourself on my show, that's a lot of press I would get. So I don't know, but no, it's a, just kidding. <laughs> I'll, I'll consider it. So, so got to write a song. I'm yeah. not a songwriter. I'm a accordion player. I used to play off sheet music. Guitar players, they use their ears. They go like this, bend notes. What is that? They're always doing stuff. Keyboard players, they're looking at, they're looking at notes. How to write a song? I don't know how to write a song. <clears throat> So, um, I write Lady for the first album, but the producer has a good publishing deal and he puts four songs that he owns the publishing on. He makes us do those songs on the first album. That's not what the first album would have been if we'd have been left alone. So he listened to the lady and says, ah, we'll save it for the second album. Now, when I wrote Lady, do you think I knew what it was? I had no, I'd never heard of it. So you go, lady, when you're with me, I'm smiling. Give me whoa, 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 your love. Nobody sounds like that. Right. I'm 74. I'm sitting here. I'm sitting in the studio. No tricks. I do that. And I thought, is that good? I swear to God, you don't know. 
not when you're starting. Yeah. If you've never done so, you know, if first time you had sex, you go, was that good? <laughs> Nothing to compare it to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? Next time you go, wasn't that good? Second time you go, oh, I got something to judge it by. Yeah. So um, it gets held off. Now that first album was, here's how Stick started. I'm gonna give it to you quick, cause this is getting stupid. When JY and I ended up in the same room in 1970, okay? He never heard a ballad he liked. He's a hard rock guy. Yep. He'd have been happier in Kiss. I could name about 10 other bands because he's that guy. But when he and I came together, you know what I mean? When you think of uh, two opposites coming together and making something together that would have never been made by either of them, that's, what, that's really what Sticks was. Yeah. I have this pop sensibility. I'm a, I'm a, a, I've said a melody man and a, a melody man in a rhythm age. I'm, I'm listening to harmony, melody. This is what I do. Um, so you listen to Lady, our first hit that saved everything for the band. It's a, it's a pop ballad for a minute and six seconds. Yeah. It's, it's, you, if, if anybody th thinks that that's Prague, I think you, you need to talk to General Giant. They're going to disagree. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, if, if Prague is, hey, DeYoung put a, put a Moog sound on the beginning. If this is all you got to do to qualify, that's a low bar to jump over. <laughs> yeah. Are you with me? I am. The Pointer Sisters did that for Christ's sake. Yep. So, <clears throat> boom, the song is born. I'm doing that. I'm again, I got the harmonies lady. Of, I wrote those harmonies specifically for the voices involved in singing. JC, the original guy, yep, he could sing higher than any man that I've ever met with that false voice. He sounds just like a girl. When he, when we put, because you could, you could voice those harmonies to the octave D. Are you a musician? Uh, I play a bit of guitar, yeah. Okay. You could put it on the low D, which is not that low. It's the, it's the deep above middle C and play it there and it'll sound like men. But because JC could sing that note and JY, we we're all high, but when we sang that thing together, you know, you know, the first time we heard that sound when we were in rehearsal, when we went, what the hell was that? Because that was, honest to God, can you imagine we're going, Jesus, did, did that sound as good as I thought it did? Yeah, it did. So I wrote that harmony, that block harmony for those three guys based on Three Dog Night. Interesting. Wow. Those power harmonies, they did those triads. I just took that idea and translated it into, hey, JC, you go on the top note. But when the band kicks in, that's an American rock and roll band. That's not a prog band. That's an American rock and roll band singing these high harmony. You know, like I used to say, white guys uh, playing loud and singing high. That, that's what Six was at that moment. And it was all sudden done. Everybody went, hey, there's another song. Nobody knew. So the Wooden Nickel albums, the first album, four songs, four of them. What are those doing? George Clinton. We got a George Clinton song on our first album. Do you know that? <laughs> the, I did not. <laughs> after you leave me. That's George Clinton. Oh, okay. <laughs> what? Okay. So we're, we, if somebody was said, stand over there on one foot and stick a piece of pizza in your ear to get a record deal, you know what I'm doing? I'm sticking pizza in my ear. Okay. So the guy said, these are the songs you're going to do. We did them. Okay. What's a producer? Well, I don't know. I, what's a producer? What, what, what's EQ? Uh, uh, you look at a board, right? For the first time, you go, Ooh, tre treble and bass. Tre treble and bass. <laughs> the choices are ridiculous. So somebody else did those records. All right. Okay, it came out. Yeah, best thing. First week came out at 80 something. I saw oh, this is easy. Next week, 80 something. A week after gone. Best thing's a really cool tune. Man, here's what I'm going to say. Listen to me, Pete Pr Pardo. Listen to me. That, that album with those high harmonies and that rock and pop and all that's, you know, that was one year before Queen. One year. I never heard Queen until um, Killer Queen in 75 when that song finally reached our shores. It's not Google. You can go to YouTube, you know. Nobody's playing. So, 
we were doing that thing. We weren't copying Queen. They most certainly were not copying us. It's just, you know, coincidence. So we make the second album. The first album does okay. <clears throat> second album, Lady gets on it. And, I, and I've been writing now, trying to figure out how to write. So of the seven songs, because it's a prog-like album, not proggy, five of them are mine. But JY hasn't written anything. So I gave him two songs of mine to sing. He sings, You Need Love. And he sings, <clears throat> I'm going to make you feel it. Because as a band, we got to keep everybody involved in this stuff. So I, it sticks to, I think, oh, I think, man, this is just, and now I'm thinking, this is really good. Ladies released, it's a stiff. Nobody plays it. Nobody cares. Like three stations. Like I said, I always said, Little Rock, uh, Salt Lake City, and Chicago. That's a terrible routing for a tour. So um, we're, we're, we're stuck in Chicago. You got it? Playing every sock hop, dance, college mixer, you, you name it. We were just trying to make a living. Um, and 6-2 was rejected so, so resoundedly. What I did naturally, Father Rova say, the Earl of Roja, I'm gonna make you feel you need love, lady. I felt they hate me. You have no talent. They've discovered that you're an accordion player. That's what I thought. Not a lot of accordion players in rock and roll, huh? There's lots. No, no, there's lots. Jonathan Cain. I get the list. There's, I bet there's 20. Bruce Hornsby. There's, there's lots of them that went like this. They started there and he went, this is a mistake. So now, the next two albums, Serpent is Rising and Man of Miracles. I'm trying to be anybody but me for the most part because I don't know who the hell me is. That's why I hate those the third and fourth album because I, I wrote a song about a pirate. I don't care if you like it, Pete. I, I think it's bogus. I think it's, it's bogus bullshit because I just made it up to try to fit in. You got me? Right. I want to belong to that club, Pete. <laughs> and the Grove of Eglin team. People seem to, there's, there is people who like that song. I think, okay. You know, and uh, there's people who like to be beaten when they're having sex. Okay. That's your thing. I listen to that music and I go, oh, Jesus. And then I listen to Man of Miracles. I started to write myself a little bit because I got Christopher, Mr. Christopher, which is pretty damn cool. I don't like the way it was recorded. We had to go down state to Pekin, Illinois to a cheap studio and leave Paragon because we were out of money. The record company, their fourth album, you didn't, after this guy's, you're done. I don't like the way it sounds, <clears throat> the record. So that's why I have those feelings about those records. Yeah, fair enough. But not takes two. Don't we always like the things that people approve of us? Of course. If your mother says, Pete, I like it when you do that. I like it when you do that. That's what you do. And I'm no different. I'm a human being. And people say, I love that. Okay. But I knew Sticks, I knew Lady was a hit. You know how I knew? Got hit written all over it. And no, 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 no. Anybody no. thought that it wasn't strange. You're wrong. I knew it was a hit because when we played it live, people went nuts. It's the fans, it's the audience that really tells you. Think what you like. They decide. So we play that song, people scream. We play another song, they applaud. We play that lady, Dave's. I kept saying the record companies are idiots, which of course they were. So uh, that's the story of why I'm not that crazy, but wooden nickel records. And I'm going to shut up and let you ask a, ask a question. Well, before we leave the wooden nickel era, um, I got to ask the title track to Man of Miracles. Were you listening to maybe a little bit of Uriah Heep or Deep Purple right around that time? Oh, Deep Purple, John Lord. Yeah. Of course, John Lord. Um, I always, my, whenever, whenever I talk to anybody about old sticks, and this is, you know, like pre crystal ball era stuff and there's so many people who haven't heard that early stuff i play them that song they're like this is sticks i'm like hell yeah it is well i the first record i heard by uriah heap was when was demons and wizards do you know what year that was what was that 72 Seven i think right was it 72 yeah something I like that. it was later it might have been 73 but i don't think it was past then yeah it's okay <clears throat> we already had that style 
but it wasn't it wasn't Uriah Heep. It was it was John Lord. It was Deep Purple, and um, so the, getting back to Man of Miracles, there's only the, the Praggy songs. Praggy. The Praggy songs on there, <clears throat> Man of Miracles, um, song for Suzanne, yeah. and Christopher, Mr. Christopher. I don't know what Golden Lark is. I'm not sure what that is. It, it, it's, it, it, it sounds more like Simon and Garfunkel to me. I don't know what that is. Because <clears throat> I, I wasn't into saying, well, this is that, and that's this. I'm just trying to make a song. So, and the rest of the album is rock and roll. It's Edgar Winter. It's it's just, you know, it, it's Rick Derringer in the room. It's straight ahead. Hard rock. Yeah. Yep. I don't have much to do with that. Um, so those are my songs. Now, JY and I wrote Man of Miracles together. Uh, and another guy made, wrote those lyrics, a friend of Jay Wise, who was into all that, you know, oh, we'll say this, there's demons and wizards or whatever the hell. And there's a bunch of people go, yeah, demons and wizards, and now they got video games. I don't like that shit. To me, it's, you know, it's not for me. You like it, you do it. I look and I go, I laugh. To me, it, it seems funny anyway. So, but da 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 that's my contribution. That's a great contribution. That's the main riff of the song. It's awesome. Yeah. That in the middle. Da, 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 da. The other part is um, I played that riff. JY Jay, sang the, uh, the, the and I'm going bottom down, down. Oh, look at the hype. We're so heavy. We don't even we don't even come out unless it's dark. Um, <laughs> that's Man of Miracles. But that organ sound. Oh, man. Ripper. John Lord, that on that track, that organ sound is something else, man. I had the greatest B3 ever. And of course, I used I did it again on Blue Collar. Yep. Tom brought in Blue Collar, the song. It was give me a John, give me a John. And I said, How about this? Ka -ka 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 -ka. Thanks, John. Ka -ka 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 -ka. Right? That's it. That's how that worked. So uh <clears throat> my point was we were never a prog band. I've said it in interviews, we're prog light. You know, most of that came from me because keyboard players get to play a part and it's not all about the show off guitar players. If you're a keyboard player in a prog band, you're prominent. You're not Danny Federici and, and, and Springsteen's band playing organ chords. You see what I mean? It's different. Prog guys can. Oh, yeah. So anyway, that's my wooden nickel. And the reason <clears throat> I went back in and tried to reevaluate. OK, Dennis, have you been too hard on these records? And you know what I thought? A little bit, yeah. A little bit. I can't distance myself from the pain of that period in the creation of those records and the frustrations. And you're talking about a guy who had a, 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 a baby girl and a wife before he had a record deal. <clears throat> I quit being a teacher. I, you know, I, I, in, the, in, the, in the three and a half, four years we struggled, I lost all my savings and went into debt to be a rock star. I know people, this is not a sob story. This is a reality. And um, I, would, I would torture myself every night on the couch, staring in the dark at night thinking, why isn't Lady a hit? Why, you know, why, why, why? And so <clears throat> when I look back on that, I can't say I'm fond of those records. Plus they don't sound good. Pete, like them all you want. Well, I agree with you there. They don't sound. Who mixed that record? I mix records for a living. Who mixed that record? Why is this snare drum so goddamn loud on Man and Man? Boom. Put, put the sum in it. You, get them. you see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's too much. There's too much wrong. Now, you take Man of Miracles and go to one of your favorite albums. Equinox was written and recorded six months after Man of Miracles. Okay. It sounds like a leap of 10 years. Yep, yep. Wanna why? I'm gonna brag. And anybody who doesn't like me, I don't give a shit. <laughs> Go scratch. <laughs> this is the truth, Petey. Listen to me. I said, I told you, lady, see what I did? I went like this. I told you, lady, was a hit. There you go. I said, I told you Stick Stew was really good. <clears throat> I said, let's go this way. We got AM records. I said, let's do this. Because 
I'm, I paid attention to the audience. That's how I became a successful cover band. I listened and watched them and thought, well, you know, that's what they like. I like it when they like what, what I do. Give them what they like, right? Absolutely, yep. I'm just, but I like it first. You know, I'm not pandering to them, but now I figured if I think it's good, I think they'll think it's good. So Equinox is created, eight songs. <clears throat> Did you guys first start to make a little bit of money with Equinox or did that come a little bit later on? The minute we say with, we signed with A&M, we got money. You want that story? Sure. Oh, too long. I want to talk about my album too. I'll give you another one of these when you send me some money. Um, so with Equinox, I said, <clears throat> I know what we've got to do. So the first thing I did is I went to the piano and I wrote Sweet Man and Blue. Great song. Now, J.Y. and I had written Lorelei in 1970 when we first met. First thing we wrote together was that. But it didn't have, it wasn't called Lorelei. It was called Grande. What the fuck? It, it, ridiculous. You know, it's two guys going, oh, how do we do this? So, um, <clears throat> remember remember that Lorelei? I mean, remember that song? Live our lives together. That's what the original hook was. Live our lives together. Right in the, And I thought, <clears throat> okay. Um, and we, we wrote it together. Fucking clever shit, isn't it? <laughs> isn't that great? Am I great? Am I fucking clever on the synthesizer? You absolutely are, Dennis. You are yeah, JY wrote, <laughs> JY wrote that. JY wrote that part. Wow. But you played it. Yes. So all you stupids out there, and I mean this, who judge a, 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 a group collective from a thousand, 3,000 feet up, you got it wrong. Bands come together and when they work, the strengths and the weaknesses meld into something special. Because if you said to somebody, didn't Tommy write Blue Collar Man, that riff? No. But yeah, but that riff at the beginning of the Grand Illusion, it's unbelievable. That that young is a genius. No, Tommy wrote that. <laughs> Not exactly. He had those chords. Do you see how foolish it is? Yeah. You try to parse it out, you're only gonna make yourself look like an imbecile. That's the truth. This is what's grand about a band. Lennon, McCartney, Ringo, Jagger and Richard. They, they, they end up hitting each other or the Pink Floyd guys. Name any band. There's two guys, usually Townsend. They come together. Something, <clears throat> something happens. That's the, that's the joy, the mystery and the magic of, of a group. So um, Equinox, I said, that's the way we go. So I'm writing Sweet Man and Be I says, OK, I know what I need to do. I, I need to write a song like Led Zeppelin. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what sells, right? <laughs> I'm, playing, I'm playing the Astanabo. They do this. It's awesome. I think this is good. So <clears throat> we go in to, uh, to, to do the thing. And I said, you know what? I, I, I shouldn't play this on piano. I said, because he just had me tinkling on, on Lady doing that kind of stuff. And they'll think these guys can only do one thing. So I said, play it on 12 string. And that's how Sweet Man and Blue was born. So what I'm getting at is, because I was pretty certain. Remember when I told you I didn't know shit and I was afraid, didn't it? After that, you know, Lady Goes becomes a gold record. So does uh, Sticks Two. I think I, sing, I think I got it. I think I got it. <clears throat> Equinox, Equinox was born. Am I involved on 78 songs as a writer? I am. Am I singing 78 songs? I am, but the band put that music together, not me. Okay, I wasn't Simon Legree over in the corner of Webb and Boy. You guys, stand up straight. Here's how we do it. No, I got it in a room, and I went, "What do you think? How does that go?" And Jay White goes, "Tick tick 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 tick." That's how it works. And then Equinox was there, and I thought, "Listen to this. This is worse." I went, "Oh my God!" I listened to Equinox. I thought. We did it. I knew we could do it. I've been telling these mooks I've been working with from the beginning, we're going to be big. 
And Jay Wise openly said uh, behind the music, yeah, Dennis was the one who believed in the band for 10 years when I was skeptical. I said, you're in the band, how can you be? You see, but it was my, it was my ambition, blind ambition, as I've talked about, that drove it because I was so scared of failing Pete. And I had risked my family's well-being, my daughter and my, and my wife, to go on this, on, uh, on this uh, adventure. Yeah. So when Equinox came out, I thought this is this is it. And Lorelei was being played everywhere, all over all over the country on news stations. They loved dee, 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 dee. they would play that. <laughs> yeah. So it, it sold 150,000 less copies than Sticks Two. It did, it did good. Yeah. 350. It did good. But I'm thinking it's worthy of more than that. And I was crushed crushed i was crushed because it, once again i thought this is where we go okay this is what we need to do we've got a real record company now but you know what happened at the same time frampton comes alive yeah on M on our record label yep yeah, yep yeah. guess where all the money went yeah we know where it all went <laughs> but it paid off they sold six million of that record at that time so it was it remember it's a music business Music, business. Yep. Music, that's how it works. So Plus, right around the corner, you got all of a sudden you got someone leaving the band. You have to go find a new new guy. In comes Tommy Shaw, and then you know from there, you guys really kind of, you know, went through the stratosphere at that point. Let me, let me tell you this story. You love this story. Is this going to be a long one? I hope so, because if not, I'm I'm leaving the room right now. Yep, you we're going to um, we're going to talk about the new albums too, right? Oh yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Don't tell me, well, we got to go now because I think- I got, I got nowhere to go, Dennis. So I'm, I'm off today. So uh, we're good. Okay. JC. He was the first guy I hired to join the three of us. Actually, it was four. Tom Narden, <clears throat> boom, chink guitar player. We weren't really playing rock till the Beatles. Boom, chink, boom, chink. That's what we're playing. Ah, da, dee, dee, da, da, everyone foxtrot. Okay, Beatles, that's where we're going. Narden decides he's going to be a geologist. He quits the band. <clears throat> Tom Narden, look him up. Man, he became a, a very successful geologist. Um, JC, we're all in, at Chicago State University together, the three of us, the Panazos and me. JC <clears throat> is also there. We see him in the hallways playing his acoustic guitar. Oh, it's, aren't we hippies? Okay, he's out there singing. And I, I, we meet and I like him. He's an odd character, believe me, but he's a sweet guy, okay? Eccentric. Um, wanna join? Yeah, okay. Now we got a real guitar player in the band for the first time. And then we get another singer, <clears throat> Ron Neiford. Could sing like uh, Chuck Negron. He really could. Not a, really a musician, but he could sing. So we were doing Three Dog Night covers, you know. So if, if we're trying to get hired, um, doing side two of Abbey Road, we do everything. You know, here's the we're gonna play hits from Woodstock, right? <laughs> so um, I wanna take you higher. Boom, boom, but you know, here's Sly. We'll do. What do you need? What do your kids want to boogie to? So that's what we're doing. Um, Neifert quits. Um, 1969, <clears throat> our manager was my, married to my, to my cousin, first cousin. He said, there's this band that wants me to manage them. We had a lot of gigs because we're, we, you know, we were pleasers. You want to get hired at the sock hops? Play the music that people want to hear. Who do you think you are? So this guy wants to see his, hire his band. So John and I and, and Vince, the manager, <clears throat> go into this space, my 79th guy he met, and there's JY in his band, the Monterey Hand. And I play. And um, I'm thinking to myself, that might be the greatest guitar player I've ever seen in my life. And the band was tight, but the music was like, how are you going to book that? Here we go, Spooky Tooth's greatest hits. What? 
You know what I mean? Uh, it's not accessible. <clears throat> but man, can that guy play? Okay, we leave. And then another guy quits. And so uh, I decided to call up J.Y. That's how it happened. His band had broken up and he joined our band. And the minute he walked in and we sang and he could play. He wasn't fooling around. 1970, he basically plays that way. To, that's how he played in 1970. He was that good. <clears throat> that's how it started. And I don't know what the question is and I don't care. <laughs> well, the question originally was about Tommy coming into the band, but you went a little back uh, later, so I just. JC, eccentric dude, man. Um, like I said, sweet guy. In 75, during Equinox, <clears throat> we were on the road for the first time. We finally, because the lady got the backup kiss. I'll say a little gene for you. I know you love the guy. Um, it, it, we're getting work with Doobie Brother, all kinds of bands, right? JC was very unhappy. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to go into details about this because to me, it's still a private matter. Understand? That had nothing to do with the band. <clears throat> he was so unhappy on the road. He was quit, threatening to quit all the time. Now we're about to go on stage with Kiss in front of 14,000 people who had their faces painted. This is, this is no time to decide you don't want to be there. <clears throat> We've waited four years for the opportunity. And, and so eventually he quit and we allowed him to. I think 10 days later, we had Shaw. And um, that's how it happened. So now we had to integrate a whole new thing. Now, let me tell you about the, the, the Shaw story, because I know you're a Sticks fan, aren't you? I am. Our road manager uh, and FOH, uh, FOH guy, <clears throat> Jim Bose, said there was this guy who was in this band in Chicago. He's, he's very good. Okay. Up he comes from Montgomery Alley. He's playing in a bowling alley, acoustic guitar doing Simon and Garfunkel. I don't know what he's doing. He's doing that kind of a thing. <clears throat> he walks in, I look at him, I said, how old is that kid? So, um, I mean, really, he's like, he's small. You know, he's, like, he's not a big guy. And all of us were close to six foot in the band. <clears throat> and he looked like a kid because he's seven years younger than me. Um, I sit down, we go to the piano, we sing Lady. He's got to be able to do JC's part. You want in the band? That's our only hit. You better be able to sing that. We go, lady. Perfect. <laughs> Swear to God. No, maybe. Okay. Good. We're just trying to make a buck. We got we got shows to be played here that are booked. With, and uh, guess what they want to hear? Yeah. You got to hear that. Come in close to the camera. They don't want to hear Serpent is Rising. That's okay. <laughs> I'm I well aware of that. <laughs> I don't care what you like. This is what they want, you know? I don't give a shit about Pete. I don't even know who you were. Who cares what he thinks? Let him get his own fucking man. So, that's it. He's got his guitar, a little amplifier. <clears throat> what do you got there? Real to real. He plays some tapes. I'll play some songs I've written. Okay, because JC did right. You know, he wasn't the most prolific, but he wrote. <clears throat> Please, I go. I got this. Did you write that? Yeah. Uh huh. Next song. Did you write that? Uh huh. Is that you playing acoustic? Uh huh. Is that you playing electric? Uh huh. Is that, that's you singing? Uh-huh. I went, oh. So I said, the guys, <clears throat> that's the guy. Yeah. He never took his guitar out and played a note. It was one of those songs, Crystal Ball. It was. I, I figured. If you go on, well, that's the song that got him hired. Okay. Now, <clears throat> you know, I have an affinity for Crosby, Stills, and Nash. I love them. And that's 
it sounded like, or America. It was in that America Crosby still, there was no crystal ball part. And I think there's, I posted recently the, the version I heard. It's on, it's on, have you ever heard that? It's on YouTube. No, I gotta check it out. What's wrong? You don't follow me on Facebook? What the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> Listen to this guy. I'm, I'm, I'm too busy, Dennis. I can't follow everybody. <laughs> oh, yeah. What's Ingrid Malmstein doing? Who cares? <laughs> Talking stuff. All the Malmstein fans are, what's wrong with that? We'll kill that man if we see him. <laughs> Settle down. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, I, it, you can go. It's a, it's a Facebook page a post about it. It sounds like it's all three part harmony and you should hear it. It sounds just like America is what it sounds. Like. There's no crystal ball, no Prague. Because Tommy is not a progger, never has been. Not by not. Listen, Tommy can do anything. He can rock. He can he can play the prog part. He can do anything because he's that good. But he's not a writer. He doesn't really think and write that way by himself. OK. He's the, he is the master of that acoustic man in the wilderness guy, fooling yourself guy. That's Tommy. <clears throat> that's what I love about him. Okay. That's what I, and I said, crystal ball. That's it. So he comes in, got to make a record. I, I got five months on the road with him before we make the album. <clears throat> I didn't know if he was a performer. I had no idea. Nobody in the band did. What did anybody? Nothing. But that's the, this guy here. Let's let's hire him. Um, and he gets on stage. The first night we're on stage at the Hammond Civic Center in Chicago. You know, JY uh, traditionally was that rather stoic guitar player, stood in like one spot and played with his teeth behind his head, through his legs, in the bathroom, in the living room, on the highway, but he didn't move much. <clears throat> Hey, look at me. He was that kind, you know, was that kind of a player. <laughs> First thing I want to see is Tommy Shares going, vroom, 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 vroom. get him down from there. He could fall. You know, he's all over the place. So um, <clears throat> didn't know he was that guy. And then I started thinking, okay, this sounds like it's all about me. Guess what? It's the truth. If you don't like it, shove it up your ass. I don't care, Pete. I looked at Tommy and he went, oh man. What's best for the band? That's how I thought. Because when I saw the name Sticks, you know what I saw? D-E-N-N-I-S-D-E-Y-U. I couldn't take my name out of those four letters. I don't mean that it's my band, like I own it. But when you looked at it, that was just a reflection on me in my mind. And I thought the other guys felt the same way about themselves. So Tommy, I said, this kid, oh my God. So I said, Tommy, <clears throat> we do crystal ball. You, we can't sing it three-part harmony. Can't do it that way. I said, the song's so personal. And I'm thinking in my mind, he's a star. He's just a, don't put, we're not going to do this. You know, you put three voices in it there, you know, who cares? One person is singing that lyric. I said, no three-part, you sing that. <clears throat> and it needs a hook. And I sang to him in, in a rental car, you got to sing the hook. Crystal ball, you got to do something like this. He went out and wrote it. We brought it in. Uh, fake proggy solo, uh, rock band. And it became a rock song, became crystal ball. So we were able to assimilate Tommy right into that. He, he, he was able to, because Equinox first, <clears throat> there's the sound. All you got to do is fit in. We don't have to reinvent that wheel. Am I wrong? That's right. You'd have been happy if we made nine more Equinox albums. You would have been. <clears throat> but he came in. And when it was all said and done, we were putting the album together. I turned to everybody and said, um, Crystal Ball's the best song. I think we should call the album that. That was nobody else's decision. That was my decision. Mm. I just had success with Equinox and Lady. So I had, I, I'm, I'm rolling. I said, no, that's the song. You know, we're not, is it Jennifer? I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, is it, uh, you know, this old man? I didn't sound like a record for old people. Um, so, but Crystal Ball was the best song. Am I right or am I wrong? 
You are absolutely right. I mean, you the got that, and, you, and I'm, I'm a big fan of the ballerina. Love that. Okay. okay, okay. Tommy had that. He had that sketched out on that tape. And I said, you know what this is? No lyric. <clears throat> if there was the lyric, I can't remember it. I said, I'm going to write a lyric about what people who in the arts, what they must sacrifice to become successful. And that's what it's about. <clears throat> Who's left behind? Who's neglected when that person has a dream that they have to go after? And I thought, well, Claire de Lune, my favorite, my dad's favorite piece of classical music. I said, I'll play that and we'll go right into it. And that's how that happened. Anyway, are we doing anything here? It's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, you know, I mean that that whole final section of that song still. Sends la, 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 oh, I mean, it's it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. You know, it's funny. I was uh, I've, I've watched it many times, but I watched it not long ago. The that old black and white footage from Winterland that you guys from from that era from seventy five or whatever. I mean, you can really tell how you guys were gelling. You know, the new lineup was really really working so well together. How much can I hate a video? Oh, they're upside down. How much can I hate a video? Our manager never let, allowed us to vi be videotaped. He was out of his mind, out of his mind, didn't know anything. Yeah, there's nothing from back then other than that, right? No, that's why that shows up. That could be the Here I am. This is when <clears throat> JY tricked me into wearing three inch platform white boots. <laughs> he says, we're going glam. What? <laughs> I'm a lumberjack and I'm okay. So I wore those boots in that outfit for like three months. I said, I hate this. I said, I can't walk. I said this about Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley. They deserve to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for being able to manage those boots alone. They didn't have to run and know. How do they do that? So that is the worst mixed, out of tune, video that I and so when people say yeah a million people have watched sweet madam blue and ah, <laughs> you know what it because like said, it's that's all you got that's all we have so it's it, it's, if you're a fan it's it's so cool to see that era of the band you know on video because it's just so yeah. so rare anyway so that's the story of uh, and it, and Tommy assimilated of course uh and then about you know and then was grand illusion so that's how that went anyway Anyway, let's get let's get back. I, I love all this old stuff, and we should probably one day just do a whole full history of the band together. But uh, we do want to plug this today. So, one of the things I don't know if you saw it. I did a uh, review of the album a couple of weeks ago. But uh, one of the things that's really cool about this record, it, not only do you kind of dip back into kind of some of the, you know, sticksism of old, right? But it's yeah. still a Dennis solo album. You can hear your love of the Beatles on here. Uh, you got some good hard rocking stuff on here. You got a little proggy <laughs> stuff. You got a couple ballads. I mean, it's like a, a little bit of everything that is Dennis DeYoung. Um, I mean, for me, I absolutely love uh, The Isle of Misanthrope, which you called earlier. You knew that would be my favorite. Uh, Land of the Living is great. I love The Last Guitar Hero. <clears throat> and all right, so just so just bear with me for a second here. So I, someone, I made this comment and someone took offense at it. But if this was 1982 or three, and you guys, meaning Sticks, through the last guitar hero on the album, I could almost picture JY singing that because every album had to have this big JY rocker. Uh, but you handle it perfectly on here. Then you got Tom Morello coming in to do that wacky guitar solo. And it's like, it's like a, it, it, it just to me sounds like traditional, that one or two big hard rockers that you guys put on every album back in the day, which we all loved, right? Um, and then uh, There's No Turning Back Time takes me right back. Uh, and then you got, you know, your proof of heaven. And you, I mean, it's just, it's a fun record that I think for us longtime fans reminds us what we love so much about you and the rest of the guys. And I mean, so what are your favorite parts of the album? And, and you know, what was it like to work with Peter Rick and Morello and all the other guys? I mean, you got, uh, you've got this great touring band. I've had the pleasure of seeing you guys play. Um, you know, you've got August and Jimmy and all the rest of the cats. I mean, it's, you know, it's, yeah. you've surrounded yourself with some really good people in recent years. Um, <clears throat> when I look at volume two, 
Um, I, I, let me make this as a statement that should get you so many responses uh, on, your, uh, on your thing here. I cannot make a Styx album without JY and Tommy, and they can't without me. That's a fact. We can make Styx like things. <clears throat> but a Styx album, you want to hear those three singers. You want to hear those three different points of view musically. You bring up Last Guitar Hero and JY because he wrote an A minor a lot. <laughs> so that, that song is an A minor. Uh, <clears throat> and he was the straight ahead rock guy. Um, but that's my premise. A Styx album had variety and it was song based. Now, prog guys here's where i'll get into the wood uh, into the woods with you on this <clears throat> most of the people like yourself you are and this is not a criticism it's a definition you like style over substance you've admitted i think that you're not that into lyrics i think well oh there's half of the shit's missing in your in what you like now, am I supposed to come over there to New York and tell you that Hudson Valley, you've been drinking out of the fucking river? Uh, no, because uh, you, you're entitled to like what the hell you like. Who am I to tell you not what to like? But I'm just saying to you, it's big music. I'll say it to you again. It's big. It's very big. It's very big. And of course, you don't care about lyrics because I still trying to find the Prague album where someone wrote a lyric I understood. Now, I liked Prague music. And the first Prague album I had, JC bought it and gave it to me, Court of the Crimson King. I took it, <clears throat> listen to Father OSA, and then go listen to the Court of the Crimson King. Well, I, so you can see who I was listening to. So, but the lyrics, what, what the, what was he talking about? I don't know. I'm not sure. Take any yes lyric. You know, I'm working, the, I'm doing a thing with John Anderson right now. Recording. Really? Yes. Wow. <clears throat> um, the hell is yes saying? I, because it's time and time without that band. And John, what does that mean? I call him a John. The fuck? No, I don't say that to him, but I'm thinking, I loved yes because I love the musicianship. I love the sound, John's voice. They created something unique unto themselves. But, you can like all good people and roundabout. I'll be a roundabout. I'm going to say, 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 go and talk to Sarah and Dinah Robbie in the city. What? <laughs> how about dancing with the moonlit night? How about selling England by the, how about the, I know what I like and I like what I know in your wardrobe, feeling better? What? Okay. <laughs> Because you know what you like? You like the sound of it. Nothing wrong with that. You like the sound of it. It does something to you. <clears throat> I got something to say. I don't care if you're listening. You don't even know what the Grand Illusion was about when you liked that record. You're clueless. You lost out. And I love you, Pete. Look at you. I love you. But you lost out because I said stuff that was so, I think, important for you how old were you? 12? I don't know when you got the Grand Illusion. <clears throat> oh, yeah, probably about that. Yeah, yeah. I don't care that you didn't know what it was about. All right. I was, I had something to say. And I said this. It was I knew about all the words. I may not have understood them, but I knew all the words. I sang to them. I played air guitar to them. That's, that was important to me. All good. Yeah. But the meaning of those words, which is why I, I think it, it, it it's, it, it's true. But if you, if you write, uh, watch people who write the reviews on prog music, right? They almost never discuss the lyrics. Yeah, half the time we don't know what the hell it's all about. It's like me trying to describe <laughs> what Tales from Top of Graphic Oceans is all about. I, I don't have a clue. Only John Anderson and Steve Howe know that. So yeah. yeah I told John, I said, John, you know, when you made uh, Top of Graphic Oceans, you left me at the bottom there. <laughs> I was going, <laughs> <"Me too." laughs> so, um, no, but when now they're going to, if you're going to review me and you're a progger, you're going to be oblivious to what I feel is something very important. And that is what I have to say to you. Well, my point of view is about myself, my life and the world I see around me. This is what I am trying to do. 
trying to tell you something <clears throat> about me, hoping that you will find yourself in my story. Pete, it's my story. I'm going to tell it to you musically. I want you to say, so when you see Babe, right? And you see uh, whatever it is, 26 million views, and you read the comments, they're telling you from a point of view that has nothing to do with your likes or mine, how much that song means to them from their heart. This person died and my mother loved this. See, that's the other side of this. <clears throat> that's what I do. It's not the most exciting and glamorous and the biggest mouths in rock and roll don't stand up and say, babe, they don't do that. Something to do with testosterone. I've never figured it out yet. Something to do with love. I don't know what that is. If I wrote babe and I changed all the lyrics, not a love song. I made it about nuclear destruction. You'd have a different point of view toward the music. Okay, you would think, oh, okay. So what I'm saying is <clears throat> people write about these albums, you know, they're not gonna, they're not gonna get in the weeds and oh my God, listen to that Beatle thing. Those are those titles of Beatles songs in there. And he's saying it's a fan saying, Thank you for inventing the modern rock band. Look what you've given me. That's what you gave me. And it was important for me to say that and say, this is how it all begins. It's my last record. <clears throat> so I don't sit down and try to um, make a Sticks album. Whatever comes out of me that feels like Sticks is Sticks. Whatever that comes out of me that feels like not like Sticks. And that's how Sticks became successful, in my humble opinion. Whether you wanted to take the journey away from what you primarily love in your life and wanted to go with us, and by us, I mean me kind of going, let's try this, let's try that. Was it selfish? I hope not. I went to England in 1978. We just had two triple platinum albums in the row. We were the kings of America and Canada, North America. We were finally going to get to play in England. <clears throat> and I was so excited because for me, where did it all start? We walked into the middle of the punk revolution it was awful. You know who backed us up? Dire Straits. Oh, wow. <clears throat> I watched. And the next day in the papers, I would read the reviews of them. And then of us. These dinosaurs of a bygone era playing this over pretend blah, 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 blah. And I thought to myself, whoa, what the heck's going on here? <clears throat> and I thought, we came back from the States, a miserable experience. And I thought, you know what? Something, something's in the air on this music we've been playing. And uh, that's when I, I, I convinced the guys to, to shift toward Cornerstone, thinking that that prog rock thing we had been doing since 1972, that was gonna be a thing of the past. And I think history proves it out. You look and you find what Prague album 79, 88, 81 made any, made no, nothing. They all, they all began to die. Yes, resurrected themselves with a pop record. Yeah, this and is a, the same thing, Rush did the same thing. I mean, they, those were the, some of the few that made that transition, right? And I just, and, and, and the reason, you know this story, the reason Babe was on that record it was a fluke. It was an accident, never meant to happen. And but look at when you, once again, when per people heard that demo of Babe, they, they were like, not you, Pete. Others. <laughs> they went, oh my God, I love that fucking song. And I thought, well, <clears throat> why not? Because I've got to tell you, when I'm writing Lords of the Ring for JY to sing, give him a song, I'm singing because he, we, we wrote, uh, he didn't write uh, Lords of the Ring, but we wrote uh, Queen of Spades together. What do you think of Queen of Spades? What do you think of Queen of Spades? My favorite stick song of all time. Who sang it? You did. <laughs> who's rocking it? JY is rocking it. No, I mean, who's singing? Who's rock well, singing? You, you, it's, that's all you. Yeah, it's all you. Then why does JY have to sing Last Guitar Hero? <laughs> <laughs> Woo! 
you know what I mean. <laughs> Jay White's playing. Hook, line, and sinker. You got me there, Dennis. <laughs> okay, he's playing. He wants to write his sweet Madame Blue. Who could blame him? He brings me that. I said, Dow, Dow. I said, It's beautiful, man. It's beautiful. And I sang the melody. That's my contribution. Luck is a lady who was a you know that part. I just followed the chords. Dun 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 do 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 do. I I just followed. You know I always say it's this diamond ring doesn't mean no man anymore. <laughs> so that's all I was doing. But what a great song that is. I love it. No, oh, it's a great song. And um. You know, it's funny, you know, here we are talking today. I actually, about two weeks ago, I listened, I was listening to Pieces of Eight at the gym and I was, uh, I was just walking and jogging around the track and that song came out and I've heard it a million times in my life and I played it three times in a row. I almost never do that. Usually I'm an album guy. So it's like, I like to play an album start to finish. I don't usually do shuffles and all that nonsense that came on. I'm totally, I'm singing it. You know, I got the headphones on. People are probably looking at me like I'm, I'm a weirdo. And I hit replay and I hit replay again. And I listened to it three times in a row. That's how good it is. It is. It's great. It, it, is Jay, it really is Jay White's song. Now, I, I brought the melody to it, of course, because that's what I do. But that's fundamentally Jay White's song. And, um, but the rock part, it's, it, it's like, in other words, that sticks. That's not a prog song. No, okay, I played the synthesizer here and there. That's an American rock band. Yeah. Yep. You know, that's that's more like it's more like Led Zeppelin and Aerosmith than it is like uh Yes or any of those Genesis. It's not really that. And I've said it over and over. We are a, at, at heart American rock and roll band who did lots of stuff. So um, yeah, I love Queen of Spades. I I, I sang it the last three or four years. I've sang it a number of times. You played it live when I saw you guys in New Jersey a few years ago. Uh, yeah. How, how, where, where was it? At Bergen or someplace? Yeah, the Bergen. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. It was good, wasn't it? In fact, I was in the front row. Oh, shit. Yep. If, if I didn't know you were famous, I'd have said hello, but you know, who fucking cares? Um, <laughs> I told Morello the same thing. He said, I saw Kilroy and I saw Paradise Theater. I was at the, at the back of the horizon. You know, it's like the, the garden. <clears throat> And the nosebleeds, I said, if you'd have told me you were going to be Tom Morello, I'd have put you up front. I told him that. And so, um, yeah, you want to hear the Tom Morello story? Sure, sure. <clears throat> Peter Rick and I, and I wrote that song three and a half years ago, maybe four. Um, it's, uh, it is the truest collaboration between the two of us of all the eight songs we wrote, where we were in a room together. <clears throat> name was what do you think i got this idea for the last guitar hero I went, will we be sued no i thought it's fantastic and he jim he loves to write songs about being in rock and roll and being in a rock and roll band you know what i say boring <laughs> this is all you, okay you're doing blow off a of hooker's ass i don't care <laughs> so cliche right <laughs> tell me something that i don't know now i know there's an audience for it pete i know there's an audience for it it's i don't care it doesn't interest me so i took the song and i thought this is <clears throat> and i thought this is really should be about technology a theme i've been talking about since 1982 and how machines de uh, machines that save our lives machines dehumanize those two ideas where do, where do human beings go wait a minute i can invent this and then i'm out of a job you know that it's that theory so i use the guitar here as a symbol because i listen to a lot of modern rock bands that they play at an xrt here in chicago and i think that's not rock and roll that, that sounds like english synth bands from the 80s and 90s i don't get it where's the guitar player they ask him to sit out in the lounge and, and have, a, have a smoke, you know, and <clears throat> it all sounds like manipulated bullshit. To me, rock bands, they get in the room and they rock, they play, they do their thing when they're doing it, okay? It's real guys, this is what they do. So, 
I wrote, rewrote the lyrics, fit that narrative. And JY, JY, Freudian, JP, Jim Peter, too many J somethings in my life. <laughs> too many, can't keep them track. You know, who's the best looking one? I refuse to it, to it. Anyway, so uh, he's got, I got this thing. I said, yeah, okay, do that. Oh, uh, do, do that. Here, how's this chord for that? That's how we created it. So he said, "Last guitar hero." That's I have a, the last guitar hero. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Like lady. Whoa, whoa. whoa. You gotta why have it in there, yeah. Why yeah. I, why, listen, I'm trying to think of this. Listen, to this. I laid it. Whoa, whoa. Why did I do that? I still have no. I have no idea why I did that when I did it. I'm thinking what? I, I might have been imitating somebody, but I can't. I can't think of who it was. Honest to God, I don't know why I did that. So I actually, that's where that, you know, look at here, well, oh. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I played a, uh, an Adam Sandler party, Christmas, Han Christmas Hanukkah thing. And Tom was there, we met and blah, blah. He told me he was a Sticks fan and he liked Roboto. Sorry, Pete. It's okay. I like Roboto too. I gave him. Not one Any of my favorites, but it's what I like it. Yeah, it's a catchy tune. Yeah. Uh, so, so here, here we go. Okay, nice guy, talented guy. Time to get somebody to play. And I think, well, Tom might be the, the last guy to do something different. He plays four notes, you go, eh, it's Morello. And I've said this a million times, but it bears repeating. Right now, you got a four-year-old Japanese girl in her bedroom playing all the Eddie Van Halen solos perfectly. Yeah, it's crazy, right? So <clears throat> I think we'll give it to Morello because he is different. Okay. And right now, a lot of people play like Ingway, Mom and Steve, don't they? I mean, there's a lot of guys that do that thing. Yep. But nobody does Tom Morello. He's unique. So I thought, let's, that was it. My son said, it's Tom Morello. Yeah, it is. And I like him. And I call him the great Houdini. Because I think, how did he, how does he do that? So <clears throat> I keep running behind his amp to see if there's someone back there doing shit. Um, he said he loved it. He played it. I mixed it. That's all. It worked out great. It was a perfect fit. Yeah. Uh, we needed, here's the thing. I'm going to tell you the truth. All the biggest mouths in the nation are going to say, we just want to rock at the top of their lungs. The people that said, God, play, even the guys who I see at my concerts, bikers, no hair, bones in their nose, like this leather. I play, babe, you know what they do? They grab their girlfriend or wife and they hug them and kiss them. But they're not going to say it out loud to anybody else. <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Yeah. I, phenomenon that I can't put my finger and I'm not here to psychoanalyze anybody that's what you want to be but really <clears throat> when they close the casket door Pete health family love no one's going to rock on no one's saying that because they're dying and they're thinking to myself rock really I'm not sure don't know if they're rocking in heaven or hell nobody knows this although every heavy metal band says they are yeah. um <laughs> so True. yeah Come on, guys. So that's the thing. Honest expressions of love make some people uncomfortable in music. I've no, I, I used to think it was what I was, I, I thought, was it my melodies? They're too, you know. And do me a favor. Can we, can we come to an agreement? Promise me. Put up your right hand. I swear never to use the word cheesy again. You want to know why? Why? Swear. <clears throat> you do what you want, because everybody loves cheese. That, that is absolutely true. I, I love cheesy movies. Um, I'm a big horror movie guy. I love cheesy horror. No, movies. no. That see, that's not what I mean. I mean mozzarella. I like that too. I'm Italian, so you know. Everybody loves cheese. I'll have more cheese on my. I put cheese in my milkshake. Will someone put cheese on my bacon? Everybody, that is the worst pejorative of, ever, of all time. And it makes no sense. No, it doesn't. Yeah. We all 
love yeah. cheap. And you know, it's so lazy to oh. use it. We live in a lazy society, Dennis. That not people, you. Yeah, I expect more from you. You get that. You made those nice T-shirts. Like that? Beautiful. Is that because of Tommy? No. You sure? Yeah. Well, it doesn't say tranquility base. You might be get sued. <clears throat> you know why you you know why you, you you what is it? All the damn. All the damn time. That's the catchphrase on the channel. We are here on YouTube all the damn time. Not when I'm at it. I'm on your channel. Think fireworks are going off. <laughs> Let me say this to you: um, Am I as good as Bev Bevan? Never mind. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> this is the best, Dennis. I got to tell you right off the bat, and I'm not just being biased here. This, this cheesy. Is I love cheese. I don't mind syrupy or treckly or yes, yeah, syrupy. <clears throat> but even syrupy, we go. I have more syrup on my pancakes. It's stupid. <laughs> I'll have more sugar. Of course we will. <laughs> how about this dog shit this is dog shit I, i'm accepting that yeah yeah okay what's next so are you uh so last week i was talking to steve lukather and he was telling oh me, fine you know who i was talking to last week <laughs> nobody <laughs> what did luke have to say well i mean we talked about a bunch of things but luke was telling me how excited he is to get out on the road because he's been you know, he's just, he just wants to go out and work. He just wants to go out and tour. They got a new lineup of Toto back together, you know, together and he's ready to go play. Um, so how about you? Are you planning on doing any live dates at all in support of these albums at all? Or is that kind of not, not in the future for you? Number one, did you see, oh, you probably know about, um, with all due respect from volume one, I said it right there. I said in the beginning, breaking news, this just in, nobody knows nothing. God damn it. <clears throat> sorry, sorry, sorry about that. You know, when I get an incoming call on this iPad, <clears throat> it, was a, it was debtor's prison calling. Um, so nobody knows nothing. Pete, hey kids. Here's a couple of rules from, from an old man who you, you probably turned off this already and said, I hate this guy, his hair's too short. <clears throat> um, there's only one rule, it's the golden rule. If people follow that, humanity would be better. No argument, right? Just, I'll do to you the way I would like you to do to me. Unless you're a masochist, they don't count. Right, yeah, that's, that's another topic. <clears throat> That's their problem. Um, and number two, how about from humanity? A whole lot more humility and less hubris. People shooting their mouths off all the time, knowing nothing is never going to make mankind better. And it's certainly not going to make a better republic in which we live. Amen. They step back and say, <clears throat> I don't know what's going on with this cootie. I don't really. And to be my age, which is 74, I'm going to take the careful approach to all this, because I have, I've come up with this idea that the first bands <clears throat> out the door to go play of two kinds. Number one, <clears throat> they're very needy. And number two, they get big alimony payments. Yeah. That's they, my thought. You need the money. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and for me, I'm married to the same woman for 51 years. And, um, I don't have, I'm different. And I, I recognize in a lot of performers, they have to have the stage. It's the only time they really feel alive. I respect it. I understand it. Okay. I, I see that need in them. That's not, that's not me. Okay. I, I know I'm, now this always sounds like a, a pompous ass speaking. Well, you've already judged me anyway. Who cares what you think? Um, I know I'm good. Tens of millions have told me, okay? I know it. When I'm on there, I've seen other people do their thing. I don't suck. But I don't need the applause to feel complete. I did when I was younger. I really did. Uh, that's where the ambition came in and the drive to help sticks become all it could be. But as you <clears throat> move through life, uh, I've come to understand 
that the minute the audience stops applauding, it's gone. Right. And <clears throat> that's where a lot of people get into trouble with drugs. Because the minute you're on the road and people are dependent on that, they need something else to supplement that high. And I don't think there is anything higher than the high you get when you're performing well. I don't believe it's true, but people, you know, musicians have been <clears throat> historically screwed up by that phenomena. And I've said this a million times, I'll say it again. Most bands don't break up over creative differences. It's horseshit. They break up for two reasons. Number one, <clears throat> drugs and alcohol. Because the people who use and abuse drugs and alcohol, it impairs their judgment and causes them to act in ways they would never normally act. And uh, boy, people love me today on this thing. They keep calling me. <laughs> so, <clears throat> oh, I know it is just my next interview. We'll have, to, we'll have to take this up. Can I do this interview? And can I come back to you? We'll finish it. We, can do, do? We, can do, we can do part two, yeah. We can do, we can do a part two. Yeah. You want to do it in about half an hour? Yeah, we could do that. So, yeah, so I'll air it in two parts. So uh, we're going to say goodbye to Dennis for right now, but he will be back to finish up. So uh, visit us on the web at www.catranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. For Dennis DeYoung, I am Pardo. He'll be back, though, for part two, and we'll see you then. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>